Shalom and praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining class. Uh, we'll begin. Can I ask any one of our online students to lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Yeah, I can. Uh, shall I just go ahead? Uh, Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for uh, this morning. We pray for your presence, Lord, over this class. We pray for your wisdom. I pray, Lord, that your word would uh, speak to us and build us up, Lord. And uh, we just submit this time. Um, we uh, just give our spirit, soul, and body to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam Daniel. So we began um, looking at uh, chapter 9 on uh, Tuesday. And uh, we're looking at Jesus as the sinless lamb. Okay, we're looking at the title and role of Jesus as a sinless lamb. And we're looking at the various um, sacrifices in the Old Testament that basically... Uh, points out to Jesus as that sinless Lamb of God who came to make that full, sufficient, and perfect sacrifice. And we also saw that Jesus is referred to as the... What is the first sacrifice we looked at? The Passover. Okay, so Jesus is referred to as the Passover Lamb. So the Old Testament feast of the Passover was a type and the shadow of the redemptive work of Christ in the New Testament. Okay, And I explained to you what is the meaning of type and shadow. So we see that the Old Testament feast of the Passover is basically a type and shadow of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, where he offered himself up as that Passover lamb, uh, for the sins of the whole world, and he did it once for all. Okay, so we were looking at um, the Passover lamb, and what was the um, requisite for the or the kind of lamb they had to choose? Yes, it had to be an unblemished lamb. Okay, unblemished means what? It had to be perfect, spotless whole and healthy okay and that is what we read in first peter chapter 1 verse 19 and first peter uh, sorry 1 john chapter 3 verse 5 so can one of you please read one first peter 1 19 and someone else can read 1 john 3 5 please first Read, read. You can read. Just keep it away from your. Yeah. First Peter one nineteen. Yeah. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Yes. So here it's talking about whom? Jesus Christ, and it says that Jesus Christ is the lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay. One John chapter three verse five. Please, someone else. One John uh, 3 verse 5, you know that he appeared to take every sin, and in him there is no sin. Okay, so here we see that Jesus was manifested to take away our sins, or he became man to take away our sins, and in him there was no sin, which means that he's a lamb without blemish which uh, because it says here that he was without sin which means he was perfect and he was pure okay so we don't celebrate the passover festival anymore even though Jesus, uh, god had instituted it and said that you need to do it throughout generations why because jesus was that passover lamb who made that full sufficient perfect sacrifice but of course we celebrate the lord's table in remembrance of what he has done Okay, now we look at a few more uh, sacrifices that were 
uh, instituted by God in the Old Testament and how Jesus came to uh, fulfill that, how he was a type and shadow of that uh, sacrifice. So the next one is the morning and evening sacrifices. Okay, so there was every morning and every evening there were sacrifices that the priests made in the temple. And this was basically for what sacrifice? Any idea? What sacrifice was this for? Which the priest is to make morning and evening? Grain and drink offering. Okay, uh, but for why were these offerings made or why were these sacrifices made? It was basically for what? Why would they make a burnt offering? Okay, why would they make a meal or burnt offering? Why would the priest make it? Yes, thank you, Lucy, for our sins, for the sins of the entire Israelite race. So if you sin, then you had to go individually and make a sacrifice to God. But if the priest was making it, he was making it on behalf of himself and behalf of all the people. Okay. So here, um, yes, Andrew says to reconcile us to God. This morning and evening sacrifices were basically uh, sacrifices for daily atonement for the sins of the people. And it was also sacrifice that was a daily consecration. They were consecrating themselves to this holy God uh, who chose to live in their midst, who chose to come and speak to them. Okay, so let's look at this morning and evening sacrifices that is um, that God had instituted and what he says in Exodus chapter 29 verses 38 to 42. So can one of you please read Exodus chapter 29 verses 38 to 42, please? Can I read, sister? Exodus 29. Yes. Can I read, sister? Yes, please go ahead to get through. Exodus 29, 38 to 42. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma and offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So here God is instituting the morning and the evening sacrifice. Okay. And he's saying that, you know, these daily sacrifices that were made by the high priest in the temple you know, spoke of daily atonement and daily consecration. So what were the sacrifices that were offered? What were the sacrifices that were offered daily? What sacrifices were offered? Two lambs. Two lambs. Okay, one in the morning, one in the evening. Okay, so it was basically a burnt offering. Okay, and it was also a grain and drink offering known as the meal offering. Okay, so we see that, um, you know, this burnt offering was a sacrifice that they made on the altar and the, the animal was completely burnt on the altar. Okay, and in addition to that, they also had the grain and the drink offering, okay, which basically consisted of what grains okay it was not a blood sacrifice it was not something that was containing blood like the um, uh, you know the burnt offerings that was made so the burnt offering was basically uh, atonement what is atonement covering of sins 
Okay, so the burnt offering was made as an atonement for sins. It was covered. It is to cover the sins of the people, and the the animal was a substitute for for people. Okay, the animal was a substitute for the people. The animal took the place of the people. The animal was made as the sacrifice for sins. Because what is the punishment for sins? Death. Yes. Okay. So the animal, the death of the animal, you know, took our place and um, made, was uh, thus made the atonement possible. Okay. Now, what was the burnt offering? Why did God tell you need to have this burnt offering? Basically, the burnt offering spoke of consecration, okay, uh, which means, uh, you know, why did they have to burn the entire sacrifice of that animal? Was because the uh, uh, and why was the entire animal being consumed by fire? Because it talked about complete consecration. That means the Israelites were completely consecrating themselves to God. What is the meaning of consecrating? Consecrating means what? What is consecrating? Yes, dedicating themselves, setting them up, uh, setting themselves up, uh, or setting themselves up, uh, uh, you know, for God, uh, submitting uh, to God. Yes, thank you, Lucy. So we see that, you know, these burnt offerings spoke, spoke of complete consecration uh, because the entire sacrifice was consumed by fire and then what does the meal offering consist of the meal offering consists of basically um, grain and some drink offering okay and it was basically people giving from their what they grew in, uh, in their fields or in their gardens okay it was just giving their first fruits of their labor so therefore the meal offering spoke of consecrating one's life and substance to God. Okay, so it was talking about how they were, you know, con not just giving their the sacrifice as an atonement for their sins, but also the sacrifice spoke about how they were giving themselves wholeheartedly. Okay, giving themselves in terms of their spirit, body, and soul, completely consecrating it to God, setting it apart for God, uh, dedicating themselves to God, and submitting to His. Um, lordship and to his rule and reign in their um, lives okay now why don't we make this morning and evening sacrifices why don't we make this morning and evening sacrifices look at it it says in verse 42 this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the lord where i will meet to you uh, meet with you and speak with you. So God was saying, I'm going to meet with you and speak with you here. And hence, I want you to be completely set apart, holy, sanctified. Okay. Basically, holy means being set apart, sanctified. Okay. So here he's saying that you need to do this throughout your generation. But why don't we offer these sacrifices anymore? Yes, Jesus was that sinless lamb of God and he made that sacrifice okay um, so how was how did Jesus connect with this morning and evening sacrifice how can we connect Jesus's sacrifice to this morning and evening sacrifice or how can we look at Jesus as a sinless lamb who made that sinless sacrifice how can we connect what he has done to the morning and evening sacrifice What does a morning and evening sacrifice require? Two things. What are the two main things? One is, why were the sacrifices made? Why were the sacrifices made? For atonement. Yes, for atonement. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. Firstly, for atonement. Secondly, for? Consecration. Yes, thank you. So, consecrating themselves. So, how... Did Jesus fulfill this even as he made that sacrifice? On the cross, yes. How did he fulfill it? He himself offered himself. 
once for all for all these sacrifices and for all generations yes thank you so he made that atoning sacrifice for the sins of the entire human race okay and he was that lamb who offered himself up as a sacrifice okay and um, made the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world once for all how else was he fulfilling the morning and evening sacrifice atonement was done what is the other thing consecration so how was how did jesus fulfill that how did jesus fulfill that Take the mic and speak. Sister, he is the high priest for us. Okay. He Thank submitted you, himself to God. Yes, he submitted himself totally and fully. He surrendered. He submitted everything, his will, uh, and just to do the Father's will. Okay. He aligned his will to the Father's will. And hence, we see that he totally consecrated himself to the Father. So does Jesus fulfill the requirements of the morning and evening sacrifice? Yes, not just like was this, you know, the sinless Lamb of God, but also in terms of consecrating Himself and in submitting to do the will of the Father. We know in the Garden of Gethsemane, we read that Jesus was troubled. Okay, uh, but what does He say, Fa Father? Not my will be done, but Yours be done. Okay, so. Let your will be done and not mine. So Jesus was going to take on the sins of the whole human race. Here was this God who is perfect and holy and pure, uh, who cannot stand sin, who cannot come anywhere near sin. And uh, sin is so detestable in his sight. But to take on the sins of the world was such a great grief and anguish for Jesus. But he was willing to submit to the will of the Father. So he totally surrendered, totally consecrated his life. And hence, we see that the morning and evening sacrifice, you know, came to an end in the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Right? They're able to understand? All of you able to follow? Uh, yeah, Sanjay says this once and for all, he offered himself up according to Hebrews chapter uh, 26 and 27. Yes, we're going to read that. Can somebody please read? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 27, and someone else can read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for their own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. Thank you, um, Lucy. Can um, someone else read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, please? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So we see that here, you know, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sins forever. And he did this once and for all. Okay. The reason why he could do this was because he was holy, he was undefiled, and he was separate from sinners okay uh, we will also look at another uh, uh, way that you know jesus fulfilled being the uh, you know the sinless lamb he became the suffering lamb okay so another aspect of jesus as the lamb of god uh, we see that he is the suffering lamb we read this in isaiah chapter 53 verses 7 to 10 can somebody read that, please? Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 to 10. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was held as a lamb to, be, to the slaughter, 
and as a sheep before its shearers in silence, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich and his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So here we see uh, Jesus as, you know, uh, um, you know, being prophesied as that lamb who will be the suffering lamb, okay, who will suffer for the sins of the people, who will die and make that sacrifice on the cross. And uh, look at what First Peter chapter 2, verses 21-24 says. Can somebody read that, please? First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 20 to 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So here the scriptures are talking about Christ as the suffering lamb, you know, uh, who will be who was oppressed, afflicted, and when he was reviled, what is the meaning of reviled? When he was, uh, you know, criticized strongly, or when he was unpleasant things were said to him, what did he do? He did not revile in return. Okay. So it describes how Jesus willingly and passively, which means willingly and very submissively, bore the penalty for our sins. He did not uh, fight against it. He did not, uh, you know, argue. He did not, uh, you know, uh, do anything to stop it. But he willingly um, and very uh, submissively, he bore the penalty of the sins of the entire human race. It also talks about him as a suffering lamb who, you know, was stricken for our transgression uh, because it was the will of God that Jesus should be bruised. Okay. Now, when you look at um, this verse that it, I mean, this phrase, it was the will of God that he should be bruised. What does it mean? What is your understanding? It was the will of God that he should be bruised. What is your understanding of it? What is the meaning of bruised? Like punished? Okay. To inflict uh, wounds. Sorry? To inflict pain. To inflict pain, okay. What else? So it says here that it was the will of the Lord that Jesus be bruised. What does it mean? Like the sense of the whole world was too heavy. So. Okay. So it, we are basically saying that it was God's will or the Father's will that Jesus should be wounded, should be battered, should be injured, okay, uh, should be beaten up. So when you think about that, what comes to your mind about the father? Aren't you all shocked? <laughs> See, he loved the world so much. Okay, he loved the world so much. The sins of the world was too heavy as he is holy. So it had to be sacrificed to such an extent. Okay. 
So it says that when it's the will of the Lord or the will of the Father that Jesus should be bruised, punished, injured, you know, inflicted all these pains, are we think saying? Are we looking at it or thinking or saying that hey, God enjoys or took, you know, pleasure in seeing His Son being suffering on the cross to show us how much He loved Him, or loved us. Sorry. No, sister, because God is just and holy. Jesus had to bear this punishment in his body, in flesh, because uh, sin is in the flesh. Okay, thank you. Yes, it was not God's, uh, you know, God was not taking pleasure in seeing, you know, uh, uh, his son suffer on the cross. Like, you know, some people can interpret it and say, you know, God, uh, uh, you know, when, when he asked uh, Abraham to sacrifice his only son, you know, how can he do that? He was just basically taking pleasure in, in seeing or, you know, when he's um, inflicting punishment on people in the Old Testament, uh, people say that, you know, God takes pleasure. And so here also we read that, you know, he, he um, it was the will of God, the Father to see Jesus being bruised. Okay, so like um, uh, our in-person student said, it was showing the extent of his love for us. But here when it's saying it is the will of the Lord, it's basically saying that this is how God, you know, had planned uh, the, the sacrifice to be made. Because if you look at a lamb or if you even now, if you look, uh, you go to the chicken shop and you want to buy chicken and you'll take a live chicken and, you know, you... You want to, um, you know, they will clean, it, kill it, and clean it up for you so that you can cook and enjoy the chicken. But you see that 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 animal suffering, right? Once they they slit the throat, you can see the animal really suffering. So it was, in a sense, that God had planned it that way. That you know, the sins to take on the sins of the world, there was suffering, there was pain because sin causes a lot of suffering and a lot of pain. So it was not something that the father was pleased in doing, not something that he was, he enjoyed doing, like some people can interpret, like some people can say, but here it was basically, you know, showing us that, you know, hey, sin, this is what sin causes. Sin causes so much of pain, damage, and shame. And uh, the, even the son of God, you know, had to go through all of this. He went through all of it to take on the sins of the whole world. And that is the full extent of the Father showing his love for us. And that is also what sin uh, does. Sin brings uh, a, a pain and sin brings suffering. And it has consequences. Now look at uh, the purpose of the suffering. You know, the purpose of the suffering of Jesus' suffering or the purpose of the sacrifice um, the, of the suffering lamb was that, you know, make his soul as an offering for sin, okay? Make his soul as an offering for sin. Now, the word offering here basically is referring to a trespass offering. A trespass offering is what is, um, you know, laid out for us or um, uh, defined for us in Leviticus chapter 5, verses 14 to chapter 6, verse 7, and, and even in Numbers chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, okay? Now, um, Jesus was made as an offering for sin, means he was made as a trespass offering. Now, if you look at this uh, word trespass in, um, in, um, in the Hebrew, it basically means guilt, okay? So it denotes guilt, uh, of disobedience, it denotes guilt of violating, which means uh, destroying or disobeying the rights of others, either it can be God or man. So when here it says that Jesus, you know, was his soul was made as an offering for sin, it's basically talking about the trespass offering or the guilt offering, okay? Uh, because the word offering here in Hebrew means trespass. Okay, so trespass offering. So what is a trespass offering? Basically, a trespass offering is made when somebody uh, disobeys God, okay, 
breaks his commandments and also somebody who's violating or going or disobeying or destroying the rights of others whether it is god or it is man okay so when we look at this trespass offering what did god require of this trespass offering you know uh, in this trespass offering when a person disobeys god or he violates uh, somebody else's right whether it's this man or god they had to make um, an offering so the offering required or included restitution restitution means you know uh, you not only just make the sacrifice to god you go to the temple and make the sacrifice but you also have to apart from the sacrifice that you go to the temple and make to god you also have to cover up the damages that were done okay by offering a sacrifice then animal and also it required a social restitution which uh, required that you you know make up for what you had done with the person you repay that person so here in the trespass offering there were two things that were uh, required one was restitution you know where you basically the individual has to cover up the damages uh, he had done in addition to making the sacrifice to god and that was basically you know um, involving you you pay up for what you had done apart from the sacrifice that you have uh, given to god so the trespass offering not only involved making atonement for your sin in offering that sacrifice the atonement covered up your sin before god but also involved social restitution which means you had to pay back the person for the wrong that you have uh, done do you understand yes so trespass offering required atonement and restitution okay atonement is when you are making a sacrifice to god and restitution is basically you're covering up for the damages so for example if you get angry with your neighbor and uh, you know they have a donkey uh, you go and kill that donkey you put some poison or something and you kill that donkey and the, uh, the neighbor comes to know and uh, you know you're judged for it so you have to go to the temple and make a sacrifice and you also have to buy a donkey and replace it with your neighbor okay so that is your restitution that you make so we see that jesus you know um, uh, became that trespass offering okay he uh, made the atonement for the our sins but also he was he, he he was he made a restitution by paying the debt for our sins the sins of uh, uh, the mankind he paid it to a holy god so when jesus died on the cross you know uh, he not only made that atoning sacrifice that uh, covered up our sins once for all but he also made that uh, restitution for our sins he paid for our sins he paid the debts for our sins uh, to this holy god you know who was wronged when we sin you know we wrong god okay uh, we hurt him we wrong him and so there was you know restitution that had to be made so jesus you know paid the sins um, or he paid the debt to a holy god who had been violated and so we see that in the trespass offering that god had instituted it was basically pointing out to jesus so jesus came and he made that atoning sacrifice and also he pay the compensation that was needed to satisfy this god who was wronged to satisfy this god who you know who was um, who had been violated by our own uh, sins and so you know when he made he paid that debt you know he satisfied this holy god and thus he was able to reconcile a man back to god okay all of you able to understand yes so in the morning and evening sacrifices what was how did jesus fulfill it what are the two things he did to fulfill it atonement and consecration and when we look at jesus as the suffering lamb uh, who made that trespass offering okay uh, what did he do to fulfill the trespass offering atonement and restitution 
Okay. Yeah. So we see that uh, he made that um, atoning sacrifice. Yes, Sanjay, you said because the father and son are one. Uh, sorry, I can't understand. What did you mean by saying the father and son are one? No, Pastor, I, I was just suggesting since uh, when Jesus bore our sins on the cross, in a way, it was God himself who bore our sins and punishment through Jesus because the Father and Son are one. I, I was just drawing a... Say that again, I couldn't hear you. Okay, uh, so, so what I was saying was that since Jesus bore our sins and punishment on the cross, in a way, it was like God himself bore our sins and punishment through his Son. Because the Father and Son are one. So you're saying it was when Jesus was doing it, it was the Father himself doing it? No, in a way, because the Bible teaches the Father and Son are one. So when God sent his Son to suffer on our behalf, it was like God taking that punishment. I, I was just drawing a... Oh, I think uh, that is not... What we see in the Bible, it was when Jesus was taking on the sins of the whole world, he was taking it because he was uh, fully man. He was in our place. He was um, identifying an our representative. Uh, but yes, he was in fully God in the sense that he was sinless and hence he was able to make that a sacrifice. But when he was making that sacrifice, it was not God the Father who was also taking the, the son because jesus on the cross says you know when jesus took on the sins of the whole world uh, and on the cross he says you know uh, father why have you forsaken me okay so he when he was he took on the sins of the whole world he was forsaken by the father because he was sin he, he took on he bore the sins of the entire uh, mankind so it was not god the father also in one sense taking on the sins of the world it was jesus who was taking on the sins of the world it was jesus who was making that full sufficient perfect sacrifice that pleased or satisfied this God who was holy, who was wrong, uh, who we had violated, who had gone against. And so Jesus' sacrifice paid the debt to this holy God. And when he did so, you know, God the Father was pleased with that um, sacrifice. So uh, how do we know that he was pleased with the sacrifice? And how do we know that Jesus' sacrifice uh, atoned for the sins of the whole world, made that pay the debt in full was because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So resurrection is also powerful and as equally important as uh, crucifixion because resurrection actually proves that yes, what Jesus did was uh, G the God the Father was pleased and um, the um, it appeased him and he was satisfied with the offering, with the debt that was paid uh, through uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, this clarifies. It clarifies. Thank okay. you, Pastor. So it was not God the Father also um, uh, with him on the cross doing it and taking on the sins of the world. He, um, but Jesus could take on the sins of the world because he was fully human. Okay, um, uh, In that sense, that's why we see humanity and divinity coexisted in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. And God, who is uh, holy, you know, cannot come near sin. That sin cannot touch him. Okay, then he ceases to be God. He sees, when he ceases to be God, he, he becomes like one of us. Okay, so I hope that clarified. I think that is uh, sometimes, again, a uh, wrong understanding and a theology. Yes, yes Pastor. Thank, yeah. thank you. But thank you for uh, bringing it up. Okay, so we see that, you know, um, Jesus uh, made the atoning sacrifice and also the compensation or the restitution that was needed to satisfy God and hence he reconciled us back to uh, the Father. All of you with me able to understand? Yes? So we're seeing how Jesus' sacrifice, you know, actually corresponds to what God had instituted in the Old Testament, the sacrifices, and how Jesus is a type and shadow, and how he fulfilled those Old Testament sacrifices. We look at another aspect of the sacrifice that Jesus made, okay? When Jesus was crucified, was he crucified in the city? 
Sit in the city or outside the city? Outside the city. Outside the city. Why was he crucified outside the city? Okay, look at what Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 and 12 says. Can somebody read that, please? Thank you, Lucy. Outside, yes. Hebrews 13, 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Yes. So here we see that, you know, um, uh, the writer of Hebrews saying that, you know, uh, the animals that, you know, were sacrificed and whose blood was brought and sprinkled by the priest, where was these animals burned? Outside the camp. Okay. And so he's saying, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, cleanse, purify, set, sanctify means what? Cleanse, purify, set apart. The people with his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. Okay, so we see another aspect of the Old Testament sacrifice and how Jesus identified with it. Jesus was sacrificed on the cross outside the city limits. And so we see that, you know, um, um, uh, he, I, he related with the animals that were burned, um, uh, that, that were offered as a sacrifice, but actually burned outside the sanctuary or outside the camp. So in studying Jesus Christ as the sinless lamb, we see how, you know, the sacrifices in the Old Testament spoke clearly and specifically about the various aspects of Jesus Christ as that lamb of God. Okay. And it's important for us to note here that even as God instituted all of these Old Testament sacrifices, ceremonies, you know, it was actually God was foreshadowing or pointing out to someone who's going to come, that is Jesus Christ, you know, who would uh, make that full sufficient perfect sacrifice uh, and would once for all make an end to the sacrifices and who would also be that perfect sacrifice. So by instituting all of these sacrifices, God was basically pointing out to the Messiah, to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ, who would be that sinless lamb and make that sacrifice okay so the last aspect of the lamb of god that we will look at is in the book of revelation so there's revelation chapter 5 verses uh, 11 to 13 can somebody read that please revelation chapter 6 verses 15 to 17 revelation 14 verses 1 9 and 10 and revelation 17 12 to 14 so different people can read these passages revelation 5 11 to 13 then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Revelation 6, 5 to 17. Can somebody read that, please? Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. And the kings of the earth, the great man, the rich man, the commander, the mighty man, every slave and every free man, hid, them, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountain, verse 16, and said to the mountains and rock, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Amen. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9, verses 1, 9, and 10. Can somebody read that, please? Revelation, Revelation 14, 1, 9, and 10. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Then a third angel followed them 
saying with a loud voice, if anyone worship the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. And somebody can read Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 to 14, please. Revelation chapter 17, verse 12 to 14. The ten powers which you serve are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. But they received authority for one hour as king, kings with the beast. There are there are one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. For he is lord for, of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So here, in this last section, what did you observe about the Lamb of God? Is it the same that we've been studying all this time? As a suffering Lamb, as a Lamb that was going to be bruised and punished? Is the same kind of example we see in Revelation? Yes? No? No, no? sister. No, we see him, like as Lucy says, as a king. So this last section of the Lamb of God in Revelation you know, it's a little out of context, but uh, of, you know, of Jesus as a suffering lamb, the lamb that was crucified, the lamb that was made as a sacrifice, okay? But uh, we are looking at it because there are 28 references of Jesus um, as the lamb in the book of Revelation. You just quoted a few verses here, but there are 28 references to Jesus as the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. So we, in Revelation 5, 6 to 14, we look at Jesus as a triumphant Lamb of the, in Revelation, who is the slain Lamb that returns from the dead, who's worthy to receive um, honor and power and might and wisdom and glory and honor and blessing. We also see in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, that he's a powerful figure who this lamb is a powerful figure who uh, ex, uh, you know exercises wrath and who strikes fear uh, in those with whom he comes into contact okay it also talks about in revelation chapter 7 verse 17 he's a lamb who is described as a shepherd of god's people okay and in revelation chapter 14 verse 1 talks about um, him as a lamb who stands triumphant on mount zion Okay, um, and also in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, talks about the Lamb as the one who would overcome in the midst of opposition. And would in uh, Revelation chapter 22, it talks about him who ultimately establishes his enduring reign upon the earth as a representative of God. So here we see that, you know, um, he is, uh, you know, he talks about the... Um, you know, uh, Jesus as, uh, you know, the apocalyptic view of the Lamb. The apocalyptic means, you know, is basically describing or prophesying the complete destruction of the world. Okay. So when Jesus comes, he's no longer going to be that passive, submissive and suffering sacrifice. You know, uh, instead, we will look at him as that Lamb who is pictured as the triumphant, victorious and overcoming conqueror, who is the king. So now, when Jesus came the first time, he came as the lamb that was to take on the sins of the world, who was passive, submissive, you know, and that suffering sacrifice. But when Jesus comes again, he would come as that lamb, uh, you know, uh, who we, we would look up or picture somebody who comes as the triumphant, victorious, and overcoming conqueror. So. It is interesting to view uh, Jesus as this apocalyptic uh, lamb, okay? Ap ap apocalyptic basically is describing or prophesying complete destruction of the world. So he's come to, going to come and destroy the world and set up his rule and reign here on the earth. So two different pictures of this lamb of God 
of Jesus Christ. One in um, the whole of the rest of the books of um, 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 uh, you know the uh, the Bible. Of course, in in Daniel we have a lot of apocalyptic. Uh, uh, literature that is also talking about this lamb, but in Revelation, basically talking as the lamb of God who is going to come to, you know, be that triumphing, victorious, and overcoming conqueror. We'll stop here. Okay. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? I hope you're able to understand this lesson. Okay. And I hope it was interesting to look at the various aspects of. Uh, the lamb, the sacrifice, and how it was fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, no questions, and we'll end class. Today's Friday, so thank you everyone for joining class, and have a blessed weekend. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Thank you.